Hello there, basketball fans. I am Jason Burgos for SportsNot.com, and I have the pleasure of being joined by two men with deep ties to Princeton University. The first is Craig Robinson, an Ivy League great and current executive director of the National Association of Basketball Coaches, and the other is the one and only Mitch Henderson, the current head coach of the Sweet 16-bound Princeton, Princeton men's team, and they are here to talk about the documentary, Think, See, Do, The Legacy of Pete Carrill, which will debut on CBS and Paramount Plus on March 25th. Thank you both for the time today. Jason, thanks for having us. This is great, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, a bunch of questions. So, there are many basketball fans familiar with the term Princeton offense. You both played in it during your college careers. Craig, uh, I'll ask you first, for younger fans who will learn about the offense and Kirill, who developed the scheme pretty much for the first time when they see this documentary on the 25th, sum up its like general concept and, and what always made it so different from the various other offenses that have been used over the last 50 years in the sport. Yeah, Jason, I appreciate that question because uh, when I first matriculated to Princeton, I thought it was sort of a particular X and O type offense where you had to figure out where to go. Where it, where, where what it actually is is a philo uh, it's a philosophical way of looking at the game. Right, you you um, give up yourself for someone else, move the ball, cut pass and uh and you have to be able to see and uh you put all that Recording together in progress. and that's the princeton offense now mitch with with how players today are coming up and there's more much more of a ball dominated play and stuff like that and so many dream in the dream they all want to go to the nba understandably it, it's teaching styles like Kirill's kind of style is it more difficult today or that might be like the problem for other programs but like princeton doesn't go those sort of get those sort of players because of the academic standards and teaching systems like his isn't it is actually possible for today's players oh i absolutely it is and i would argue that the if you look at the history of princeton basketball including our current team there's been great players that have learned that the absolute most fun way to play is to play together to concentrate on what what you can do on every possession to make someone else better um, raises the level of your own game. Um, you know, I, I think back to Coach Carrillo would say often that he would he thought Bill Russell was the most influential player in the history of the game because, and then he would say, which I thought this was very much of what Pete would say, and I, I think of this often, there might have been better players that were bigger or stronger or faster, but no one influenced the game more in the things that matter the most than Russell. This is what I think of when I think of Princeton basketball and the guys that we recruit, like, and we ask them very direct questions. Um, you know, some of it related to basketball, but some of it just to see how they'll respond to, to um, an honest question, like, and, and, that, and then that in turn is often related to how hard you'll work towards the things that matter the most on the court. Now, uh, Coach Carrillo's era was pretty tough, and, 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 like, there were, you know, there are many stories, some pretty funny, about some of the, like, kind of wild stuff he would do to set a fire under a player's butt, and I think the era you guys also played in, athletes, they were just, I think they're a little tougher, you know, people in general were a little tougher, but, well, like, his unique, for such a unique guy like, like Pete Carrillo, would he be able to, to the, be in today's era of, 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 basketball and college basketball you know the social media transfer portals portals all that kind of stuff all that kind of craziness or did he kind of get out at the right time and avoid all that stuff mitch you could take this one you know I, it's hard to say I, I would say that you know this current era of uh, college basketball you know requires adaptability and you know I, coach changed a lot in his career as a coach he adapted the, to the style of of the players and you know there was one theme as craig's mentioned which is um you know basketball you know playing playing together playing for one another giving up yourself but um the one thing that he would not compromise on at all was basketball as basketball as a metaphor for life mm. um so if if you if you had a, a aspirations to do it your own way 
he would be he could be very convincing uh, to you and then and then to your peers that um, no, this is the way we're going to do it. And he often thought that you know great great players make great people. Um, that when you're really committed to doing the things that win, it makes you it makes the bond of a group grow. So um, I think of it that way, and and uh, he'd figure out a way to say it much better than me. But uh, <laughs> basketball as a as a metaphor for life that that was coach. Going back to the idea of stories about Kirill, that funny, maybe not funny. Craig, is there certain specific standout memories you have about the coach? Be it funny, be it meaningful, kind of impactful, deeper stuff that always stayed with you over the years that you use maybe your own coaching or are, are part of why, you know, coaches plus media decided to do a documentary on him? Well, yeah, and 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 Jason, there are many stories, funny there are stories that are inspiring. Um, you know, there are stories that um, that we still tell to each other, and they they stand the test of time, right? So in Mitch's era, I could hear one of uh, one of the players on his team tell a story very similar to what happened in my era, but just changed for the times. Uh, but one that really sticks out um, out out to me um, is is and it's not really a story it's really a lesson right coach always thought that you know if you were a jerk off the court you were probably a jerk on the court and vice versa uh and it was one of those things that i i carried with me um throughout my my early development my young adult life you know working in corporate america and 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 now as an executive just sort of how to how to sort of put your team together right you look for the kinds of people who just aren't jerks right <laughs> yeah. and they're fun to work with yeah and and um you know that was a lesson that at the time i was just thinking yeah you know you don't want to play with guys who who uh, are selfish, right? And 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 you want to be a giving person, both on and off the court. But it really was something that 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 has helped me throughout my life. It's helped me pick a spouse. It's helped me raise my own kids. So uh, just as uh, important today as it was forty years ago. Mitch, how about you? Any stories of, of from your time with Pete that that resonated through your life that you've also you may pass it on to your current players? I have two two distinct parts of of coach uh, in my life. Once as a player, and then once in the last twelve years before he passed away, he was pretty much at every practice. And you know, first part that I would I would you know of course I would echo Craig. You know, I, he. Um, I, I think that his gift was he told you the truth um, in front of your peers, not easy to hear. But as Craig would Craig mentioned that you what happened would what, what happen is you either shed a layer of skin uh, or, or, you know, what, what you were afraid of happening or you took it personally. And I think that um, I don't know if he, I, I think now fast forwarding. He, he had regrets about that uh, in a way, but um, we, di we didn't, you know, uh, we appreciated it because it made the team closer. And I think he was saying, you know, he wanted me to say, nah, coach, it's okay. But, uh, you know, cause some of the stuff he said could be humorous and right and harsh. Yeah. Uh, but at Princeton, I felt coach thought that that was what he needed to be for us. And 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 he he would he would often joke that he was eight, right eighty five percent of the time, uh, and I think I think that's about accurate. <laughs> I... And Jason, if I could just add in there, uh, you know, coaches like a parent who, um, when you tell them about the spankings you got, the parent says, "I didn't spank you that much," and <laughs> and when, later on in life, we'd sit with him. And while he's watching practice and we're up in the stands, say, hey, coach, you remember the time you said this? And he would never remember <laughs> the stuff he Total said. Total denial. Total denial. <laughs> and and it was endearing. I mean, Mitch, I don't know if you felt that way, but it was so endearing to me that, um, that he had a different view, just yeah. like you do as a parent, just to, like, like we have as coaches when we look back at our players. Uh, and it really, um, he felt 
to Mitch, to Mitch's point, he felt bad. And I just kept telling him, you know, coach, you changed all of our lives for the yeah. better um, with that brutal honesty. So uh, it's just it, it just warms my heart to think about him and think about what Mitch is doing and knowing somehow he knows what's going on. I come from like MMA media background. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like a martial art where technique can overcome size and strength and you can be superior without being a super athlete. And I always felt like the Princeton offense was kind of like that because of the elite players may not be going to, to the school because of the academic standards that's required, the lack of scholarships and those kind of things that go to the sports programs. Where, you know, if, where if you were, you know, if you could be smart and hustle, the technique of the system can overcome better players, which, which, we have seen in, in the upsets that the, the school has had in the tournament over the years. Craig, you can take this one. Was Kirill's offense one that was very much technique, kind of over talent in a lot of ways? Well, it, it when you start when it started out, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think that he was really trying to make up the talent gap with precision more than with sort of uh, precision and philosophy other than athleticism. But I, I'm here to tell you, you know, I, I have worked in high school, from high school ball to college to NBA and watched parts of the Princeton offense at every level. And the better the players you have, the better the offense works, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and, and I will tell you, people always thought that uh, uh, better players couldn't pick up on this. You had to be sort of like a, an intellectual to understand the Princeton offense. Uh, and, and what I will tell you is that really good players are intellectuals. Mm -hmm. They may not be book smart, but they are smart people. And, right. and you know, when, when I was at Oregon State, we led the, we, we led the Pac-12 in scoring using this offense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and what now, what, what I see with this Princeton team is Mitch has gone out and recruited the kind of guys who could play in the Pac-12 and who could play in the Big East and now they're running it, so you're getting to see what high-level athletes can do in the with this offense. Now, before we go, we we have to talk about the school's big game coming up against Creighton in the Sweet 16. Mitch, you, your team made history by by being the fourth 15 seed to get to the Sweet 16 in in tournament history. First time Prince has done in the modern era. Your team won six straight including the Ivy League tourney, beat Arizona, second great win against Missouri in the tournament. Where do you feel your team has really stepped stepped things up over the last couple of weeks that you feel confident going into this game against Creighton? So we've always had, and, and this is, uh, there's parts of this that's very much me, and, and um, often I'm, I'm forgetful on what's Coach Carell or even Craig or Bill Carmody and, um, all of it's all of it's sort of together, but I would say that we have worked very hard um, over time, and that that includes from the big, beginning of practice all the way up until today's practice at getting better, dribbling as hard as you can with your left hand, getting to the middle and spinning back and making a layup. Uh, we we beat um, Penn in the first round of the Ivy League tournament on a move a freshman made going in transition. Cade Pierce, he got a, a, an outlet, took two dribbles from about half court, a one foot layup. He's really a two foot guy. <laughs> and this was this was a layup we've been working on for five months. And it was the culmination, in my opinion, of work. And that was that was my experience as a player at Princeton. So that's first. Second, I uh, the coach would say, what do you see? And we said to the guys all weekend, you know, this is what you're going to see against Arizona. And, and coach would also say to us, I'm preparing you to win the game. So you, I, I think, you know, you, the way my head works on this, Craig, is, is uh, you know, you, you, and this might be called smart, but to me, it's just the way we are. And what we do here is play to win. So you can't take bad shots. You got to get back on defense. You got to make it a half court game. And then against Missouri, who pressured, was relentlessly pursue great shots. We out rebounded both teams on the weekend. We had more points in the paint. We got better shots and we didn't turn the ball over. I'm hopeful we can do the same thing against Creighton, but I will tell you the group has ultimate confidence in itself after what happened against Arizona and they're playing uh, with joy. They're not playing with like, oh man, we're happy to be here. Yeah. 
and I think Craig will appreciate this. And I say this, and I know Craig will appreciate this. I say this with full respect of all the former players at Princeton, but this group has done something that no one else has ever done, and they're doing it in a fashion that's making all of the former players very proud because they're doing it with grit and toughness. Um, there's elements of Kirill everywhere, but also I think it's the toughest group we've had in a long time, and uh, I'm so proud of them. Just one and more. I know Coach would be Coach would be too. One more question on the game: the the majority of Creighton's wins this year are to very good teams. They, I mean, uh, they, yeah, they and especially their losses are to very good teams too. Um, obviously, casual fans like myself will think, well, Princeton, they, you know, they beat Arizona, they beat Missouri, they can definitely beat Creighton. But your opponents are a ten point favorite going into the game. What makes them a, a tough test? And are there facets of their style of their game that are better than a, a team like Arizona that was highly ranked? Getting to the Sweet Sixteen, where the the level of play rises and the level of the team, the the commitment to the team rises. Creighton's very well coached. Um, they have a big man, a seven foot one big man, who will present a lot of challenges for us, um, and a really good guard and Nemhard. Uh, but um, we have to remember what got us here. Um, we've played tough. There, there's been fearlessness and. Uh, our fans are the best. We are drawing on our fans and we've had great and terrific support. We had this amazing hysterical crowd in Sacramento that really pulled us through and willed us to victory. And um, I think that uh, that also showcases the the commitment to the group. So, we're, you know, Jason, you're right. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a huge challenge is presenting itself for us, but we're not afraid. Um, Creighton's a really tough matchup, but they're, they'll – I think the best version of us will come out on Friday night. Craig, what would you say Kirill's like lasting impact on the sport is beyond beyond Princeton offense? That that'll, that'll be a lot of the one thing a lot of people remember. But beyond the Princeton offense, and and you're hoping that it gets across in this documentary on him. Well, you know, there's so many things and things he do for people to take away about Coach Kirill and his philosophy toward the game of basketball. But um, from a basketball standpoint, people are going to understand that this whole idea today of positionless players, right? Being a Coach Kirill wanted all of us, no matter if you were 5'10", or if you were six seven like me, or if you were seven feet tall, he wanted you to be able to dribble, pass, and shoot like a guard. And it 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 opened up my game for me in a way that made me be wildly successful beyond what I ever thought I could be. And he's done that for a lot of players. Um, and and I think that's one of the big basketball takeaways from from this documentary is that Coach Kirill was one of the first to sort of teach people how to be basketball players, irrespective of how tall they were, how strong they were, how fast they were. All right, last question, since we're, we're talking about Kirill's legacy, Prince is in Sweet 16, hoping to do big things. So far in this tournament, Mitch, you and your team have added new sections in the university's history of upsets at the tournament, but reaching the Elite Eight would establish an all-new chapter to it. How important is it to you to continue adding to this tournament legacy that, that Pete Kirill and his uh, his team started? I mean, I, we're, our, our objective is to be us, um, be ourselves, that's what got us here. And I would think that that's enough uh, for our alums and for where we are at this point. Now, that said, you know, touching again on, on the coach's legacy, he was so proud of the, his overall impact on the game. Um, and that, that being positionless play, a, a passing skilled center around four shooters. And that's us. If you look at Tosan, uh, his ability to find others on the court, facing the court and all different angles and his willingness to share the ball uh, in order to highlight the strengths of others. Um, we, we were going to highlight who we are this weekend and, and uh, we, we think that's tough to cover. And as Greg mentioned, we have really good players. So I'm excited that uh, and, and hopeful we can keep this thing going.